Back when I was in college, I had a part-time job at a Hibbett Sporting Goods store in Chattanooga, and it was a, a pretty dead mall called Eastgate Mall at the time, and it, it was just not a place for a lot of activity, especially in the morning times. And on this particular day I was working, I think there was only one other person in the store with me, and this gentleman came into the store, and pretty quickly I just thought something was weird about him. He began to uh, ask a lot of questions about a lot of different merchandise, and you know, beyond what the normal person, most people, they, they know what they're coming in for, they come in, they get it, or they just browse around the store. But this guy, you know, he was going from place to place asking questions. It just seemed weird, and, uh, and, and it kind of struck me that, you know, a, a month or so earlier that the company, the, the manager of our store had told us the company may be sending a mystery shopper into the stores, and uh, Hibbets has a thousand locations, so I really didn't expect it to happen on my watch, but I, I thought, this guy, you know, he seems like maybe he, that's what he is, and so I, I kept helping him, and, and the awkward part was when he went into the dressing room, and and he came back out with less items than he went in, and I had to confront him on that. And, and oh, I forgot, I forgot one of the things in the dressing room. And so I had my A game on because I knew he, you know, that's what he probably was. Well, lo and behold, a few weeks later, I get a report. We get a report from the store in the store that the company had sent a mystery shopper from Birmingham. And not only was it just a mystery shopper, this guy was one of the vice presidents of Hibbets. And, and so he was, he was a big deal. And, and I actually got a really good write-up, which made me feel good, except I forgot which way was supinate and which way was pronate on shoes. Most of you probably don't know that. I didn't really know it either, right? So I just, I guessed and got it wrong. But uh, you can Google that later if you'd like and, and figure out what that is if you don't know. But anyway, this guy was a mystery shopper, and he was coming to see how we were doing on the stuff that we were told, here's how you operate, here's how you display, here's how you sell. And he was checking us out. Well, it would be interesting when it, if Jesus came into our church, or any church for that matter, and checked out how things were going, if things were going the way that he commissioned us to do things, and how he told us to do things, and the, and, and the purpose and the motive behind why we do what we do. And unfortunately, I think in, in, the, in the Western church, there's so much stuff that we put an emphasis on that Jesus probably wouldn't care a whole lot about or even be impressed with at all. You know, we put so much emphasis on, you know, the Sunday morning service, which is great. I mean, it's so encouraging. I missed last week, and it was, you know, I really missed our church and the love that we feel and the, and the community that we have. But, you know, the truth is church is so much more beyond just a Sunday morning gathering. The church is the way that we interact and the way we do life together. And Jesus would notice those things. He wouldn't just come in and say, oh, wow, that's good attendance on Sunday morning. That's a good way of doing things, or, you know, good band or whatever. But I think the the... the the way the Western church does, we've so much emphasis on so many things that Jesus would definitely would not be wowed by. In fact, I was reading, I'd read this before and then looked it back up, that there's a church, and I won't say the name of the church, but this is not some fringe prosperity church out there that's, you know, we think, oh yeah, that makes sense. I mean, this is a Southern Baptist church, um, and, and the, the pastor has written a manual on spontaneous baptisms, a how-to guide. All right, so a how-to guide on spontaneous baptisms. So after the sermon, that they, what, what they do is they have people planted in the audience, and this is straight from his manual. It says, 15 people will sit in the worship experience and be the first ones to move when the pastor gives the call. More intentionally, um, walk in, move intentionally through the highest visibility areas and the longest walk. And so he wants these people just to make a show coming forward as if they were responding to the altar call. And the volunteers, when they, the people get up for the baptism, they're to pick the younger, energetic people first to be on stage and not necessarily those who were there first. Isn't that sad? Isn't that just, I mean, if Jesus came in and he saw that in a church, what would he think about that? Manipulation. That way of coercing people to make an emotional decision that they had not even thought through. And so what would Jesus notice? I want to know, what, what does Jesus care about? And, and the great thing is today, as we look at the church at Philadelphia, from Romans chapter 3, that this is one of the two, only two churches that Jesus had only positives to say about, nothing negative to say about them. And that makes me want to say, you know, wow, what, what did, got Jesus' attention? What did he note? What did he say? What did he brag about? And so we're going to look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13, and we're going to see what Jesus notices here. 
And we're going to call this the missional church. And I'll explain that term if you're not familiar with that term in a minute. The missional church. So verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. So let's hold on there for a second. If you missed part of the series or most of the series, uh, when he says to the angel of the church, most likely that means the messenger, the person who's actually going to be delivering this letter to the congregation. And so this is Jesus giving John the words to take back to the churches, seven literal churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey area. And he's given these, these uh, people this letter to, to tell them, here's what you're doing right in this case. And the map that we've used over and over again to kind of give you a perspective, you see the seven different churches and how they're scattered out through Asia Minor. And John is writing from this island called Patmos over here, and he's not there on vacation. He's there because of his service and ministry for Jesus. And so he's been put onto this island, exiled there as a punishment for his stand for Jesus and for his faith. And so John is writing from this location. He's writing to this church, number six there, Philadelphia. And here is the words that were given to this church from Jesus. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know, what you, I know that you have little strength, yet you, keep, you have kept my words have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my commands to endure it patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new, my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray and we'll look at this text. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that gives us purpose, meaning, clarity of living. God, it gives us just a, a motivation to walk out of this building this morning and to conduct our lives in a different way. And God, I pray that you will help us not just to be hearers, but to be hearers and doers this morning. God, I pray, as you've told us again and again throughout this, these, these letters so far, that help us to listen, to pay attention, to really allow this to change our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 7, he said, to, uh, this is for the church of Philadelphia, and he says, these are the words of him. Jesus, remember that Jesus is directly dictating this. Unusual, no other parts of Scripture will see Jesus directly dictating to someone, to John. And he says, these are the words of him, Jesus says, who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. And so Jesus says, I'm the holy one. And that's significant. Why is that significant? Because that's a term used for God in the Old Testament. He was the holy one. And what does holy mean? It means he's perfect. He's above all others, absent of sin. And Jesus says, I'm the holy one, the title used of God. That's me. And then he also says, not only is he the holy one, he says, I'm the true one. I am the true one. I don't know if uh, you guys text a lot. Most of you probably do, but... Texting is a great benefit, but it also can come with its perils, can it? Anybody ever accidentally text anything that, like, you wish, you're like, oh, man, I didn't mean to send that or to type, it changed the typing? Anybody besides me? All right, I was sending a text this last, or two weeks ago, maybe now, and I, I sent it and I said, I said, I meant to say praise God about something, and, and it said praise a God, right, Mark? Um, praise a God. And Mark said, uh, maybe I should post that on Facebook, Pastor, right? And there's a lot of people in this world who, who just praise a God, right? There's a higher power. There's a God out there. But the truth is, Jesus is making it very clear and very certain that he's genuine, he's authentic, he's real, he's the only true God. And so he says, these are the words of him, a better way of wording it, who is the, tr the truth, who is, who is true and who is holy, the true and holy one. That's who Jesus is declaring that he is. And so he's saying, I'm God. I'm equal to God. Now, I know that when we come to the Trinity, this idea of the Trinity, it's one of those things that's hard to get our mind around, okay? 
But let's uh, step back for a second, and let's talk a little bit about that, and let's also talk a little bit about why Jesus had to come in the first place. Why did God have to come in the flesh? Why did God have to come to earth in the first place? All right, maybe that's one that's like an easy answer for you, but for those who are newer to the faith, or maybe you wouldn't know how to articulate this to someone who asks you this question, why would Jesus have to, or God have to come in the flesh in the face of Jesus? Well, it was necessary for him to be born under the law, Galatians tells us. What does that mean? The law was God's standard of holiness and perfection. No human being could keep the law. No one could live to the holy standard that God had set. Yet Jesus came, God in the flesh came, to live under the law, to fulfill God's law on our behalf. So Jesus was perfect. And the second thing is, it was necessary for the Savior to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you have kids, they may say, I don't get it. Why do you have to have shedding of blood for sin? All right, I don't really know for sure the answer to that. You know, I could give you some good stuff that sounds smart. The truth is, Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness of sin. You've got to trust it at face value that it required a sacrifice. And so year after year, Israel and the nation, they would bring their sacrifices to the altar to cover over sin for a period of time. It was a temporary covering for, for sin so they would not feel the consequences of their atrocities toward God. But God set something in place here through these sacrifices. It was a foreshadowing of Jesus coming who would be the ultimate sacrifice, who would bring forgiveness of sins, that sacrifices would no longer have to be offered. And so God came incarnation in, in the flesh. God came to fulfill the law perfectly, and also he came to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. So we know those answers, but sometimes we forget the why behind it. And so uh, Hebrews 10.5 says, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you've prepared for me, Jesus said. He said, I'm the offering that God will forever fulfill the obligation that God required. And he said also, he said that, that, that he was the one who came for the forgiveness of sin, the lamb who would take away the sins of the world. And so if Jesus is God and he's only God and he is the true God, then what? Do you got the Holy Spirit? You got Jesus, you got the Father, do we have three gods? No, the Trinity, there's one God in three persons. And you know, oftentimes you see it as the triangle, represented as a triangle. But there's not three gods, there's only one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not forms of God. Each of them is God. And so Jesus makes it clear, he is God. He's the same as God. He came in the flesh to fulfill the law and to be the perfect sacrifice for sin. And then he says next, he says, these are, the ones who, uh, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What does that mean, the holds the key of Di David? Has anybody ever gotten into the, in the mail a key that's from a car lot, a car dealership, and it says, bring this key to the lot on Saturday, and you may be the one who wins the car, right? And, and, and it's supposedly that, you know, there's one key that will fit into the lock, and if your key is the one, then you walk away with the car. Anybody ever go to the dealership? Try that out. Yeah, a few of you, yes. Uh, well, I read the odds of winning that, and there actually, there has to be a winner, but unfortunately, it's not at the lot that you probably went to, all right? It's numerous people who join together to do this promotion, this advertising gimmick to get you on the lot to sell you a car, but one in 120,000. But the truth is, there's just one key. There's just one key that will work. And Jesus makes a point. He says, I am that key. I hold the key. I am the key. And he says, I hold the key of David. What does that mean? He says, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who came to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. I'm the one who came in the lineage and line of David to show that I am the Messiah, the true one, the Savior of Israel and the world. And so that's what Jesus is saying when he, when he talks about that. But then he goes to this picture. He says, not only is a key, he says he's able to open and shut a door. He says, I can open and I can shut. So as the holder of the key, Jesus alone has the sovereign authority to determine who goes into his kingdom and who doesn't go into his kingdom. Jesus is the key. And I think if there's any area, parents, that we need to just drill down to our kids in this culture, in this society, is the fact that Jesus is the only way. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. And in a culture that wants to act like that's intolerant, that's unacceptable, that puts other people down, that discriminates against people, and all the things our society wants to say to belittle that, Scripture and Jesus makes it very clear that He is the only way. And it's critical, it's critical that we pass that on to the next generation so they don't walk out into society and say, yeah, Jesus works for me, but, you know, whatever works for you because we're all ultimately going up to the same God anyway, and however you get there, whichever side of the mountain you go on, it's all good. Jesus is a way. He's not the way. We've got to reinforce that again and again and again and help our kids see through Scripture why that's true and that we can trust the words of Christ when he said, it's exclusive, it's me, it's just about me. So Jesus holds the key, and then he says, he's open, look at verse 8, I know your deeds, see, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I place before you an open door that no one can shut. I was talking to Harrison the other day, and we were talking about a sermon, and he remembered the illustration I used, but he couldn't remember the, the point of the sermon. So I know that using visual illustrations helps, so Mitch is going to help me get this door right here. And Keller, will you help too? Will you bring this door up on the stage? And uh, I'm hoping that you'll remember the purpose behind the door and not just the door, but it will help you remember, okay, yeah, that door up there, okay, maybe that makes sense. And so you can lean up against that chair and stand it up. We tried it out. It works, hopefully. The engineer, Stephen Whitaker, told us we need some weight in front of it, but we opted to go with our own way of doing it, just like that. And so if it falls over, blame me. If I shake the stage, it's going to fall. Stephen will say, yep, I was right. Got the, yeah, get the keyboard, All right. And so, and so Jesus says, hey, I, I, I've got this open door that no one can shut. So he says, I'm the key, and I have this open door that no one can shut. So what's he talking about there? I think first and foremost, he's talking about the availability of the kingdom of God for all those who come through Christ, all right, what we just talked about for a long time, that Jesus is the door. He holds the key. He's the door. He opens the door. People enter in the kingdom through Christ. But I think it's more than that. I think that is that, but I think it has a bigger view, a wider view. And let's look at some verses from the New Testament, which kind of illustrate what he's getting at here with this church at Philadelphia, what this open door could be. Look at, uh, and these are on the screen if you want to follow along. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, Paul uses this phrase, and he says, A great door of effective work has been opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. So he says, there's this great door that's been opened for me to go through. In 2 Corinthians 2.12, 2, he says, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So this idea of an open door was an opportunity for ministry to advance God's kingdom. And so it was an opportunity for this church to advance God's kingdom. So as they sat there in the city of Philadelphia, which truly actually existed, um, they had an opportunity to advance the mission, to advance the kingdom, to move forward and do something great. And so they were a missional church. To be missional means to be sent into the world and not just expect people to come to you. All right, so many times in church we have this attitude and this, and this mindset that, you know, people should just, like, come in here because they just, you know, wander off the streets or they see advertising or whatever. But the true idea of what Jesus has called the church to be is this idea of missional. It's a shift in the way the Western church has thought because it means that we go and we engage the world the same way Jesus engaged the world, by going out rather than just reaching out. We go out. We're involved in people's lives. We're involved in the community. We're involved in areas that we might not normally be involved in for the purpose of the gospel. Uh, this last week, I was able to spend a little bit of time with a guy who's been here several times named Ray Dash. Ray is a pastor of a church in Newark, New Jersey. And if you've ever been to Newark, New Jersey, it's not really a very pretty place, okay? It looks like, like war-torn Afghanistan parts of it to me. I mean, it, it just, it, it's just not a nice city. But uh, Ray is doing an incredible work there among uh, the people, many who are strung in on drugs and, and uh, just have lost hope in life and faith in the government, and, and they just, many of them are constantly on the street. And, and, and Ray 
has um, de- decided to move away from the neighborhood, the nice, comfortable, suburban-type neighborhood, what, we would, what he would consider for us, it wouldn't be considered suburban, but suburban area of Newark, and he moved to the area where their church is, which is in a very, very rough part of Newark, and it sits on a major bus route, so it's noisy, it's loud, and there's lots of people coming and going, and so he lives in, in the parsonage right next door to his church. And right there on that spot, he's able to walk outside and engage people, engage the community. And he was sharing with us that there's so many at risk, as you can imagine, teenagers. And, and this kid that's in the picture here, I'm going to share about him in a couple of weeks. But um, he was a kid that was hanging out with them, and they said, oh, come on to dinner with us tonight. And they brought him with them. And, and there's, he said there's numerous kids just like this. And he said it's not unusual for them to have 60 kids from the neighborhood in their house on any given night, just loving them and and showing Jesus and just letting them be part of a family that they would never experience. Ray and his church understand this idea of being missional, this idea that you just don't sit and say, oh, come to us, but it's a going out in the normal flow of life, in the things that you do and putting yourself in situations where you encounter those who need Jesus and, and, and those who need to understand the gospel and they have no family, no understanding of community, and no understanding of what it's like to be part of something that really matters for eternity. And so Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia, he says, look, you have this open door. You have this open door in front of you. And I want us to look at four things that he notes about this church, because I think these are things we can emulate. These things we can copy. Look what he says. He says in verse 8, he says, I know your deeds. I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So the first thing he says, he says, I know your deeds. He says, I know you've been faithful. You've been doing the right things for the right reasons. And he says, I want you to keep doing these things. Your heart's in the right place and you're laboring for Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus says, I want to see you doing. And their gospel message was motivated by grace. It wasn't motivated by works. It was motivated by the grace of God. And so they were serving out of the right place, out of the right heart. And they were um, internally driven by love and fulfilling God's purposes. And in most of these churches that we've looked at over the last weeks, there's been a big call to stand firm, a big call to keep the faith and and be true to doctrine. But with this church, it's more than that. They've given more than just that you stand firm, but now they can make advances. They can go through the open door and make advances for the God's kingdom because internally, Things are the right way. They, they're, they're, their deeds are right. They're doing the right things. They're, they know the right things, and they're applying those things. And so when our doctrine is correct, and then we're applying the things that we know, then God begins to give opportunities to make a difference, to make a dent in the culture we live in. The second thing is, he says, I know that you have little strength. Now, I know that sounds like a criticism, right? Right? But it's really not. It sounds to me like, you know, when you read it, it was like, oh, you're kind of feeble. But he's not saying this. It's not a negative. He's saying your church may be small in numbers, but you're having a great impact upon your city. That's what Jesus notices. Jesus didn't say anything about how many people were coming to their church. He didn't notice, you know, wow, man, this is impressive, your building that you're in and the things that we notice. What do we say? The first thing we notice is, wow, that's a big church. And what do we mean by that? There's a lot of people coming there. Jesus notices that they have little strength. They're small, but they're making a difference. And I love this quote. I don't even know who said it, but it said, the mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. The mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. So as a church, and what Charles was talking about, discipleship, the goal of of our church is to equip you, the believer, through not only a Sunday morning sermon, but through things like Eye to Eye in the summer, through uh, K-groups on Wednesday night, through Fight Club, through women's ministry, through children's ministry, through all these things is to equip you to go out and be missional, for you to go out and to live out the truth of Christ into the community you live in, into the place you work, into just the normal flow of your life. That's so much more powerful than, hey, we're going to put on a great show in here, Bring your friends, have them come in. We're going to impress them and wow them. We may wow them. We may impress them, 
for a few Sundays or a few years, but long-term discipleship happens because of why. The next thing he says, he says that you have kept my word. That's where discipleship and equipping comes in. You know the word and you keep the word. That you understand that this is the foundation for your life. And you anchor your life down into God's word. And when it isn't a Sunday morning service or a Wednesday night group of people together, you can know that I'm anchored in the truth because this is what God says, and by faith I'm going to live that out. And you know that yourself, and you're in God's word yourself. You know, as I've gotten older, I've kind of thought through like the things that I do well and the things that I don't do well. And I see so many times that I have good intentions about a lot of things, but I have no follow-through because I don't have any, any structure to make that a real, reality in my life. And I think that's where a lot of you are at because I talk to a lot of you. And there's no consistency in you seeking out God through Scripture on a consistent daily basis. There's no consistency in... Uh, your reading of God's Word and allowing Him to just speak to your heart and to change your life. Because you have good intentions, you want to do that, but there's, there's no discipline to, to put certain times and places in your life where that's going to happen and, and make sure you have a routine for that to take place. And so it's a constant roller coaster ride for you. You get excited, you get motivated, you're like, yeah, I need to do that. And it's like a few weeks and then you're off again and then you're back on again, off again, on again. And this is not what Jesus would be impressed by, plain and simple. Jesus is impressed because they, their, their deeds were in the right place. They had a little strength. They were small, but they were doing the right things. And they were keeping his word and living by his word. And they understood that this life was, is God's massive story. And their life is not the point of life. That God is the point of life. And they wake up to that reality. And they wake up to that truth. And they see that through Scripture, and it's reinforced by the Holy Spirit taking it and making it real in their life. So, real practical, real practical. Start a habit of being in God's Word on a regular basis. Make it happen by creating time, setting a time that's going to work for you, and then begin to form a habit around that. And there will be some days when you open your, your Bible, and you're like, oh, man, it's I don't get that. I wish Pastor John or somebody was here to explain this to me because it makes no sense to me. I had uh, one guy text me, and, and I talked to him again this morning, and they're getting a study Bible, and that's great. That has notes that will help them during the tough uh, passages to help them understand more of what the Scriptures are saying. There's so many great resources out there to help you be in Scripture, but you need to anchor into Christ's words and make that be the center of your discipleship. And then the fourth thing he says, he says, you have not denied my name. He says, even though there's pressure in your culture, you're getting it from all sides, you're staying faithful. You're being true. You're not ashamed of me. And so Jesus has placed this open door in front of them. And he's the one that determines when it gets open. And he's the one who determines when it shuts. And it was open for them. And if we're going to be faithful to the things that Jesus notices and cares about, Jesus is going to give us more and more opportunities. He's going to give us, as a church, more and more open doors, things like ESL. Wow, what a huge opportunity, right? I mean, thank you, Allison, for putting that the way that you did because it, it, it made it so, so easy and, and, and like understanding the ministry side of it. And it's not just about going in and, oh, I, I helped, but it's about making an impact for people who feel lost and confused. And that's our, our, our purpose and so instead of spending our time criticizing immigration policies or criticizing, you know, the government and the way they're handling of things, maybe we put more of our energy in something that actually makes a difference in people's lives for eternity. And not saying, I'm not belittling, I know we need laws and policies and we need to enforce those things. But the truth is, we spend too much of our time focused on things that we have no control over and we should focus on something that we have control over, which is stepping into people's lives and making an impact for the kingdom. And so Jesus will create opportunity. And then verse 9 is interesting. He says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So what's that talking about? Well, Christians of the first century lived in a very uneasy relationship with the Jews who were still holding on to Judaism, which was the majority of them. And for those who are maybe newer again to church, 
um, Judaism, the Old Testament law, everything that Jesus came to fulfill. I mean, that's our heritage. That's who we are. We are part of that lineage of, of, of what's happened, even though we're Gentiles, most of us, from the Old Testament times forward. But here's what was happening. The people who were Jews by birth were claiming, man, we're the insiders. We're the religious people because we know God. Like we're, we're part of Abraham and his, his heritage and, his, and, and this is who we are. We follow, we're true. And that makes sense if you think about it. If you think about like a branch, think in your mind like a branch of Christianity that's kind of broken off. Okay, and kind of went kind of different about things, and they do things differently. Maybe even they're not in the bullseye. You know, they're doing things that are unorthodox. And so we look at those people and we think, well, they're just not really Christian. They're not quite with us here. Well, that's how the Jews would look at Christianity. Here was this break off of these people who claimed that Jesus was Messiah, and the majority of the Jewish people, they didn't accept Jesus as Messiah. And so there was this tension that was involved. Who's true Jewish people? Who's not true Jewish people? And the thing is, in the early church, most of the Jewish Christians, they would continue to go to synagogue, the place where the Christians gathered, or the Jewish people gathered and read the Hebrew Scriptures. They would continue to go there on Saturday, but on Sunday, then they would gather on the Lord's Day, and they would worship together. And so there's this tension that existed. But Jesus makes it very clear. He says, look... These people, they're liars. He said, they're not truly Jews because they do not accept me. What makes someone um, truly a part of me is the fact they accept me as their Messiah. Part of, part of God is they accept Jesus as their Messiah. So he says, These real, the real Jews are the ones who believe in Jesus. And so there was this tension that existed. But look, he, he says that they are over the synagogue of Satan. So he says, ultimately... Who's the enemy? The enemy is Satan, is the ultimate enemy. He's the ultimate en- enemy of the gospel. So he says, these Jews are of the synagogue of Satan. And, and God says, Jesus says, I'm going to make them come and work, fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So you see what he's doing? He's building them up. He, he, he's saying, look, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of pressure, not only from the Roman government and those who oppose you, but there's also from the people who claim to be God's people. And they're pressuring you, and, and they're, they're cutting you down, and they're belittling you in the way that you're living. They, they had it terrible. They had it from all sides. And Jesus makes it clear that, look, you're the one. You're my bride. You're the one who I love. And they're going to one day fall down and acknowledge that. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. One day, all people will have to acknowledge that Jesus is God. And so doesn't it make our mission even more critical that we want to live for the name and the glory of Jesus? Because we know ultimately they're going to have to stand and give an account for what they've done with Christ. So he says, these people are liars. They claim to be insiders religiously, but they're not. Verse 10, he says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So he says, I'm going to keep you during this hour of trial, this this tough time that's coming. Now, there's a lot in this passage, all right? And so I'm not going to belabor this a lot because if you go back to the Thessalonian series, we talked a great deal about that in the OS when we had the people come up for an illustration of when is Jesus going to return? Is there two returns of Jesus? Is there only one return of Jesus? Is there this thing called the rapture that will happen and then the tribulation and then the second coming? Or does the church have to go through the tribulation? Well, this verse here is the one that's referenced most by those who would believe that Jesus will rapture, like a secret rapture of his church, take them away, and then the tribulation, the bad things will happen that we read in Revelation, and then Jesus will return, uh, the second coming, set up the new heaven, the new new earth. Uh, This is the verse that is, is most solid for that perspective. But just like anything, there's two perspectives. Obviously, there wouldn't be brilliant scholars and pastors who believe there's only one return of Christ. And how do they get around the fact that, you know, it says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. Well, it makes a lot of sense if you follow the logic to keep from the hour of trial doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be taken away. And I'm not advocating one or the other. I just want to show you um, a couple of verses in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. 
Paul says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of the Father. And then another verse, John chapter 17, verse 15, Jesus' prayer. And he says, I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but you keep them from the evil one. So keeping from does not necessarily mean physical removal, right? So you see both sides of that, that there may be, it may be true that Christians who are alive, uh, the tribulation will happen and they'll march right through the tribulation and God will give the grace to stand firm and stand strong. Or Jesus might rapture his church out and then the tribulation comes and then Jesus returns. But you know what we agree on? The most important thing, which is found in the next verse, verse 11, Jesus says, I'm coming. I'm coming and I'm coming soon. And we can all, no matter where we fall on this, which it really doesn't matter, the truth is Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. And what does he say? He says, when he comes, uh, he's going to be coming. And he says, so hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. So what are we supposed to hold on to? Continue to believe. Continue to, to, to not waver in the fact that Jesus is Messiah. Regardless of what happens, regardless of what people tell you, regardless of the pressures of society, hold on to that faith. We talked about this because every one of these churches ends with some kind of warning to those who are going to abandon or jump ship, or those who, who may be considering, you know what, this isn't for me. And he says, so that no one will take your crown. What's a crown? The crown is the prize for the winner of a race. And the, the, the runner who stays till the end, they get the crown. And so he says that your faith, true faith, will endure to the end. It will stick with it to the end. And think about in your life, think about people you've known who've come into a body, this body or another body, and they made a profession and they were all pumped up, but a few weeks, a few months later, maybe a few years later, they just sort of went back to their old way of living. Faith endures. Faith sticks with it. I think John MacArthur says it so well, and I'll just read the quote from him. He says, It is true that believers are eternally secure because of the power of God. Yet, the means by which he secures them is providing believers with a persevering faith, a faith that sticks with it. Christians are saved by God's power, but not apart from their constant undying faith. Constant undying faith. So here's the call. Here's the call. As parents, we don't say, oh man, my kid prayed that prayer, good, I'm good to go. You know, now I go and we we turn our attentions to other things but we continue to reinforce the faith, continue to build in, to teach apologetics class like Tony's doing for Life Prep You on Sunday morning for the kids. We teach them the faith because we never know when it's going to, like they're going to grasp it and get it and they're going to own it. Because scripture makes it clear over and over again, especially in these letters, that those who can claim to be Christian yet wander away from the faith and just go about and live life on their own terms, they're in a very shaky spot they're in a very insecure spot there. Because if, they, if that's the story of their life to the end, then there was never really transformation because Jesus changes us radically. And it's a slow process, but how can the Holy Spirit move in and take residence in your life and, and, and give you the power and move you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, yet nothing really changed about your life? Sanctification, becoming more like Christ, is a process, and it's a slow, painful process, but it's a moving forward. It's a fight. It's fighting against sin and putting our faith in Christ day after day. And it's not our works, it's not our action, it's not even our our willpower that does anything with our salvation. It's all Jesus start to finish. But like MacArthur said, that faith, the way he, he, but the means by which he secures us is providing us with a persevering faith, a faith that lasts. And then verse 12, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. You know, the people in this area of Philadelphia, in this part, this area, the city, 
they experienced a lot of earthquakes. And so as a result of that, they often had to abandon, they had to leave their city. And so how much more special would this phrase, never again will they have to leave it? They'll have a home where they never have to run and abandon. They never have to, to, to move out to a temporary home. That there's this, there's this new Jerusalem coming down, a new heaven and a new earth, this kingdom, and they're going to be pillars, and Christ will write his name upon them. Man, it's amazing that, that the fact that these Christians who are so beaten and so battered, and they're staying true and they're staying faithful, and they're longing for this kingdom to come, this unshakable kingdom where Jesus would reveal himself. How do we live in light of that? It's so easy to lose purpose and focus and direction. How do we do it? We hold on to the word. We just consistently, daily, we hear from God. And we say, God, you know me better than I know myself. You've made me, as the video said. You understand me. And you know I'm prone to wonder. You know I'm prone to leave the God I love. But I need you. I need my faith to stay strong. And I need you to be real in my life and true in my life. And we, every day we look into the mirror of God's word and we allow his grace and his goodness to sustain us. And, you know, those people who were in this time and those in this, on this earth today who are experiencing tribulation and suffering and persecution, they're longing for the day where Jesus said that there will be no more sickness and death and tears and division and tensions and strife. And if that's where you're at today, you're sitting here and you're like, man, I, I long for home because life's tough. You can relate to the people of Philadelphia. And that's why Jesus gave them the encouraging words. For those who are, who are suffering with the physical or mental struggles or just temptations that seem overwhelming, you can know that you have a kingdom to look forward to. One of my favorite bands um, they write a song, and here's a few words from the song. It says, In a world full of bitter pain and bitter doubt, I was trying so hard to fit in until I found out I don't belong here. I'm going to set sight and set sail for a kingdom come, and I will carry my cross in a song where I don't belong. And I think that so sums it up. We have our sights set on our eternal home, but we carry our cross, we have a song on our lips, and that song is Jesus my Redeemer, my Savior, my hope, my comforter, my everything. And we carry our cross and we live through the struggles and the pains of this life and we don't quit, we don't give up, we keep our eyes firmly set on Jesus, the beginner, the perfecter, starter and perfecter of our faith. And we see that he's our strength, he's our power. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Grace Church, do we hear what the Spirit is saying to us? Because we can't allow ourselves to walk out and say, oh yeah, we had a door up there. But Jesus has opened an opportunity. He's the key. And he says, Grace Church, if you're doing the things that I've called you to do, if you're faithful as this collective body of people, if you're being faithful to me, I'm going to give you opportunities to advance the kingdom into places and neighborhoods and people that you never dreamed possible. But as long as you're content with just playing religious games, coming in and sitting in church and checking it off, oh, I did church. I feel so good about myself. You didn't do church. Church is this body that God is using to sharpen us, to help us through the struggles and trials of life, to make us more like Jesus. So your next step is you've got to establish the discipline, the routine, the rhythm where you're in God's word and hearing from God. And that's the first step. If you're not there, all right, you just need to pause everything else and realize that if, if you're trying to live a moral life on your own without hearing from Jesus and letting him be your strength, then you're going to fail and you're going to be a terrible representative of the body of Christ. And then secondly, you have to engage in community and the more I study scripture, the more I see why community, the body of Christ, the people of God together is so critical 
in our sanctification, in our growing to be like Christ. We're going to do a whole three-week series on that in a few weeks. I don't want to say too much here, but the truth is you need to be a part of a K group. When we start this back up, you need friends around you. Guys, you need people, guys, who we call fight clubs, who who are going to help you and sharpen you and hold you accountable and point you to Jesus when you don't feel like looking to Jesus. Ladies, you need each other. Women's ministry or through relationships that you have in this church where on, on those days where you feel like just giving up and giving in, that you have people who are going to lift you up and encourage you and provide the support and rally around you. Those who, if you're not in a K group, you, you, you need people who are just going to physically meet your needs. When, when life is tough and you lose somebody or you have a tough time in life, you need a group of people who are going to rally around you and to just encourage you through meals and through prayer and through just being with you and spending time with you. We need those things. You need those things. The body of Christ. And then live for his glory and walk through opportunities as God provides. I like to say it's all about Jesus. It truly is. It's all about Jesus. He's truth. He's the one. He's God. It's all about him. And when we point our lives and our life compass toward him, he provides us opportunities to do things way beyond our abilities. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this body, for this church, the people that you're forming in your likeness. God, we, we know we're weak. And, and like the, 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 the scripture that you gave to the church at Philadelphia, that, that, they, were, that they weren't necessarily many in number and in them themselves they weren't that impressive but God in that moment of humility and those those times when we really truly see that we don't have much to offer that we spiritually are are so weak that we can't even make it through five minutes without sinning or missing an opportunity God and it makes us just realize that how much we still need a savior how much we still need you. And God, I pray you'll use this body to sharpen each other, to encourage each other, to motivate, spur each other on for love and good deeds. And God, I pray for those who are are withering in here, those who feel very, very hurt, very alone, very sad, very depressed, God. I pray you'll use this body to be an encouragement to them. God, to, to lift them up and to Um, And and I pray you'll help these people to allow others to come into their life to be that encouragement and support they need. God, we thank you for what you're doing here. And God, I pray you'll find us faithful. Faithful in order to, that you'll open doors for us, opportunities for us to go through and to live for you. In Jesus' name.